Hi everyone, and welcome to our last First Friday Art Talk of the Year. My name is Hisela. I'm an adult services librarian with the Salinas Public Library, and I'll be handling the tech side of today's event, while my supervisor, Kathy Andrews, will be serving as the facilitator. So normally, as you guys are probably aware, our art talks are divided into half-hour segments. However, Today's a little bit different. Instead, we'll have a 45 minute interview between Kathy and both of our poets, followed by a 15 minute Q&A from the audience. As always, we'd like to give a very special thank you to both of our speakers. Um, today we have Daniel B. Summerhill and Kenya Burden. And I'll let Kathy tell you a little bit more about each. Very good, thank you, Isela. Daniel is Assistant Professor of Poetry, Social Action and Composition at CSUMB. He's performed in over 30 states, the UK, and his poetry has appeared in Columbia Journal, Rust and Moth, Button Poetry, and others. He holds an MFA in creative writing from Boston College and has published two collections, Divine, 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 and Mausoleum of Flowers. Kenya is an awardee of the New York Silver Key in Writing and the NEA Big Read Award. Through her work, she tackles difficult themes around racism, sexism, and other isms that plague America. She hopes to promote understanding and equality for the next generation and is currently a CSU Sacramento student majoring in communication studies. So welcome to both of you. I gave that brief bio, but I would really love it if each of you could say a bit more about your uh, background and interests. Cool, I guess I'll start. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the for the event and all that. It was lovely. Appreciate it. I'm, uh, in addition to, I guess, all that stuff, more importantly, I'm from Oakland, East Oakland, California, and I've been in the Monterey area for a few years now because I teach at CSUMB. I have a wife. Her name is Kiana Summerhill and a little daughter, a little girl. Her name is Genesis Summerhill, and I have another one on the way who's blank Summerhill, and she'll be along in July. And I'm, I'm, you know, happy to be in this area and happy to, to represent the county as the laureate. So I'm Kenya Burton. I was born and raised Salinas, east, east side of Salinas. Yes, I'm currently a student at CSU Sacramento, Sacramento State to be exact. Um, I've been doing poetry my whole life, probably since I was a kid. I can just remember having a notebook always nearby and being very loud and um, <laughs> always filling space. And so Based off my background and being raised by a proud single mother, I always was invested in the art and my community and just giving back. And now I'm uh, technically a senior at Sac State and I'm going into communication studies and um, focusing more on nonprofit work. So I wanna continue giving back to my community in more of a policy and legislation way, but also through the arts. So I get to do both on the side. That's great. Thank you both very much. Um, my next question is, uh, I wonder if you could speak for a moment about the role poetry has played for you both as a reader and a writer. I'll share. So this is, this is a good question to, I guess, start off more about background stuff. So um, I'll try to keep it brief too. So there's two, two folks that are responsible for me writing poetry. And I like to think that I was perhaps born a poet and I figured it out later on. And so that happened in middle school when my oldest sister, Tanisha Smith, who's, a, who's also a poet and 15 years older than I am. So I'm the youngest of four, I'm the only boy. And so my oldest sister, Tanisha Smith and I are the closest out of, out of all my siblings. She got married when I was in middle school. I was about 11 years old. And she um, got married and moved to the East Coast with her new husband. Uh, and she left behind a photo album of poetry that she had written while she was in high school. And in that photo album of poetry, one of the poems that I still remember to this day is called Wishing Upon a 747 because stars aren't visible from the inner city because of light pollution and all that. And so coming to that poem as like 11 year old and realizing what language could do, realizing how you can set up, you know, an image, right? Or, or like this idea of, you know, um, light pollution through this poem was fascinating to me. So from then on, like I was interested in poetry. The other half of the reason why I'm a poet um, is a person named Justin Ross, who was my English teacher in ninth grade. We did a unit on poetry. Um, we got to read our poems to, to the class. And so the next class, he pulled me to the side and said, Daniel, um, he gave me two things. He said, uh, he said, Daniel, you have so much talent, never waste it. And he gave me this, this journal, right? Uh, and that quote is still in there to this day, right? So much talent, never waste it. It's like falling apart now, right? This is a long time ago. And he gave me my first novel that I read from cover to cover called The White Boy Shepherd by author Paul Betty. 
And so it wasn't a huge gesture, right? And that's what kind of pushed me and nudged me along in terms of poetry. Poetry saved my life to keep it, to keep it really brief, right? Um, you know, poetry, language is how we know we exist. Language is how we wrestle with, with ideas, with the hardships, with our triumphs. And so for me as a young person, um, it, was, it, was, it was just that, right? It helped me kind of make sense of the world in ways that I could not in other ways. Um, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that, right? Reading and writing, writing poetry for that matter. Super, how about you, Kenya? I would say that my story is very similar. I've always compared poetry to being like a seed that was planted when I was a kid. And then as you grow and learn, it kind of turns into the flower. And one thing that I love um, growing up, we always listened to Tupac. And so my mom would constantly play when we were a kid and she would always say, you guys are the flowers that grew from the concrete so show the world that you are. And so um, my background, I came, I'm a survivor of domestic violence and just growing up in a childhood like that is very quiet and very silent and you don't really get to have your own voice. So. I think poetry did save my life, regardless of every situation I've been in. Poetry was always my way out and it ended up getting me through school and in these different endeavors and just finding a way to show the world what my heart was feeling and in a healing sort of aspect. So in that way, it was really inspiring, especially when you were reading other poets or other women of color or other people who look like you and had your experiences and they're able to say the things that you aren't able to say in that moment. And I think that's what also pushed me from reading those books and being like, I can do this too kind of thing. And then working with kids one day and then being like, I can do that too. So it kind of, you get to keep it going. That's great. I, I think this might be a good moment um, for our first reading. Uh, Daniel, um, would you like to go first with a reading of one of your poems and then we'll follow up with Kenya? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So I'm gonna read a poem that has a very long title as well as a, a epigraph from Hanif Abdurraqib. The title is, What I Imagined My Mother Meant When She Said, You Sound Like One of Those Conspiracy Theorists After I Tell Her Nobody Should Be In Prison. And the epigraph reads, I am interested in what it feels like to imagine yourself as large and immovable as the sky. Imagination is a possibility we don't yet have a language for. When you've been taken, you focus on the pieces that haven't. What's in front of you, she says. There's less room for possible here. What I tell my mother Sunday at dinner, the sky we look up to is larger than the world it surrounds. And we didn't have a name for heaven until we decided some people don't deserve to be there. Or Kyle Rittenhouse sitting in a bar with neo-Nazis makes him the devil or God, depending on your definition of salvation. Or my mother and I watch outside my living room window. I decide only a deity could shake a tree that big. So I ask the wind to show me its palms to check for scarring. I want to see the battle wounds, the bruised joints, buckling skin, and deliverance resting on tender ankles. We once watched the earth shift against itself, as if the cascades reconsidered their location. And I am reminded, she has witnessed possible. I am a nod to my mother's hands, outstretched over me, like an invocation, asking the day to end before I do. Thank you. Go ahead, Kenya. First off, that's amazing. <laughs> Me fangirly at the same time. Um, so this piece is one that I wrote previously and kind of revised over the years and it's called Sisters of Trauma. We are sisters of trauma. We whisper into the darkest corners of the night, the secrets we scratched into walls as we gritted our teeth and forced screams from words. We know barren corners how many inches a bed is from a floorboard, how deep they will have to bury us to forget. Different beds, same scenarios. We convince ourselves, we make excuses. We wrap the noose tighter around our throats, telling ourselves that even bad men need love. We know the reason why lullabies and cries rhyme. Sweet sister, he will make serenades out of you and sing them to other women. Now we are the bell tolled to warn the village that bad men are coming. We know what gunpowder tastes like, how it feels to spit out ammunition only to be blamed for a war we never started. What is a pawn left to do when there is no one there to guide it? We ask into the shallow void, the emptiness before the sand drips into unmeasured time. 
We are the game left unfinished in an abandoned house, a memory, a nudge to the cranium, a guess on a late night that keeps you awake, the persistent cry that makes the man stare up at the ceiling. Okay, very good. Thank you both very much. That's part of what makes this an extra special First Friday Art Talk, um, is, uh, is being able to hear your, hear your poetry. I wonder if, uh, if you could each speak to the themes that, that underlie your writing, um, what the main ones are, have they changed over time? Um, are there some that have been there the whole time? What, what do you think about the themes? Yeah, I think definitely think it's changed, right? As a young person, as a young writer, um, I was most interested in like expression, self-expression, right? And we always hear like poetry is about self-expression and that's cool. Um, and then later on in life, towards high school and then early in college, um, I started reading a lot of Baldwin, James Baldwin. And he talks a lot about, about writers. Um, and, and, and then one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Nina Simone, who in an interview, in response to asking like, what's the role of an artist? And she says, well, the, the duty of an artist is to reflect the times. And she says, that's true of painters, of sculptors, of musicians, of what have you. And so now um, I, I like to think that my only rule when I sit down to write is to tell the truth. And James Baldwin says, we don't always know what the truth is, right? That's what we're after in the writing, but we do know what a lie is. And so that's the only thing that hangs over my head, you know, as I, as I write is to tell the truth, right? And then there's also, I'll read you a little excerpt of, of uh, this is what James Baldwin said in a, in a speech that he gave at UC Berkeley in 1987. He says, writers are obliged at some point to realize that they are involved in a language which they must change. And for a black writer in this country to be born into English, into the English language, is to realize that the assumptions on which that language operates are his enemy. And so that's a, from a speech on language, race, and the black writer. And so again, now when I sit down to write, I'm thinking solely about the idea of wrestling with the truth and trying to articulate that the best way that I can. And in addition to that, it has to be, um, I have to use writing as a in service of, of excavation and chronicling. Because if I don't tell the stories of, of what I witnessed, if I don't tell the stories of, of what's out there, then like who will, right? And then what interest do those folks have that are gonna tell the stories? And so again, my golden rule is to tell the truth. That's what I hold over myself. That's what I teach is to tell the truth. I think I've, I think as you grow older, poetry and like its meaning changes a lot. And I know for me, when I first began, it was more of a personal development, like going through experiences and things that I had personally went through in my life. It was more intimate, if that makes sense. And now as I'm older, I've been able to branch out to not only talking about my individual experiences and the things I have faced, but also on a larger level where I create these pieces that are love stories. So one of my favorite um, poems I ever written was Salas, and um, it's a love letter to my city, you know? And it's, especially if you're from here, a lot of people have a lot to say where they're like, this so it's so hard to love. You know, there's so much stuff going on. There's so much bad and I just, that was my first poem where I was like, this is what it feels like to love someone. Like to, despite the bad, to always believe and have hope that things are gonna get better and things are going to be better. And I think that is the true transition to, I look back, I started like really young. So a lot of the stuff is not my best work <laughs> to put it uh, nicely. And I just, I like being able to see myself come into my own, which was really the biggest thing I saw was my confidence changed a lot. And I got to explore new avenues of not only self-healing, but also how do I show the world that like we're more than this? Yo, Kenya, shout, shout out to, to those bad poems. I have many of them, <laughs> many of them that I, you know, published years, years, years ago. And I'm like, yo, yep, <laughs> yep. Um, but we don't put our foot down and we can never get anywhere. So, so you know, those big poems made us who we are, I guess, today, yeah. That's actually an excellent segue to my next question, which is um, the folks who attend our First Friday Art Talks um, love to learn about the artist or writer's process. So when you are writing poems, what does that look like? Um, 
is it you know sit down every day is it inspiration strikes is it somewhere in between i would say a lot of my work has come in like inspiration strikes like i've never been one of those that's like sit down and you have to write this and you have to do that um who knows maybe one day i'll get to that point but it's always been i've always had a weird process where i'll be watching something or an experience or even if the wind is shifting a type of way i'm like mm, this is this is great weather i'm gonna write something like it's very it's always been a strange occurrence and i feel like for every poet and every artist we all have something that inspires us or keeps us going so for me it's never been something where it's like i can sit down and immediately come up with something Sometimes I'll be at class and I'll see something and I'm like, that would be a good poem. And it's like always with this strange thing. And it's something my mom has always mentioned where she's like, were you, were you just writing something? Like we'll be at like a Chinese restaurant and I'm like, you have a pen? And I'll just like randomly like start writing something down. And it's something cool. It's like one of those magic tricks you pull out where you're like, wait. Kenya, we lost a little bit of the audio when you were talking about the magic tricks. Um, uh, if there's a little bit that you could could repeat from from that point so one of the things that I kind of do I, I always call it a magic trick where I can never really sit down and write something it's usually if like inspiration strikes then I'm like oh I'm immediately going to write something down so like I could be having lunch with my mom at a Chinese restaurant and I'm like you have a pin and I was like I need to write this down I need to get this down and things like that there's never been a flow it's always just been random and out of nowhere and I think that's what makes poetry beautiful is that it doesn't have a structure and sometimes it doesn't even have words it's just it's all you you know and it's the most I feel like it's the most personal way you can speak to someone in a language only you know and I've always loved that about poetry because as someone who's a student, you know, not all of us love essays and, you know, that kind of writing, but to love writing, the only way that you can do it is the best part about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to that too. You know, poetry is a bodily art form, right? Meaning like it derives from the body. Before we had a printing press, before we had commas and periods, like everything was oral, right? And so it doesn't matter if like it starts off in the body because that's where everything originates. Um, and I guess that's kind of the answer to my qu the question too, is um, I used to think that like, you have to sit down and write like every day. And that's cool too. It's cool to like practice the act of writing. So, you know, that's that's a good thing. But also um, poetry isn't always like pen and paper, right? Or, or font and text. Poetry for me happens like sometimes I take a nap, right? I've written many poems like just before I close my eyes um, because that's, you know, when when an image where, where, where a thought will come. Um, and they used to call me like in high school and like college, they used to call me bags as a nickname because I always had like a backpack and in the backpack was like mad journals. You know, the homies were like, yo, why are you always carrying bags? And like in that bag was like notepads because there was always something I needed to write down. Like you said, Kenya, at, at a spur of the moment's time. And so now I find myself fascinated with music and culture, reflecting the times as Nina Simone would say. So whenever those things kind of, you know, jog my interest that's just usually when like a part of the writing happens so then I sit down and like pull out the backpack and those notepads and compile all these these images these lines these thoughts and then like I make a poem you know at some point in that in that process but it starts off very much sporadic I guess um yeah whatever whatever kind of inspires me whatever I think needs to be said whatever kind of truth needs to be kind of exposed very good. I, I wonder if we could shift a little bit um, now. I know that uh, at the moment you both are poet laureates, and uh, if you could say a little bit about um, the process that you went through to um, achieve the poet laureate status, status, and then um, what what do you see your role as a poet laureate? Well, to answer the question. The poet laureate position was super interesting to come by. Um, shout out to Andrew Sandoval, because um, it was right after um, we had our first poet laureate. Um, I'm blanking on the name when she did her, uh, her poem at the inauguration of Joe Biden. And I remember after that happened, I got a swarm of messages. They were like, we could see you doing that. Like, oh my gosh, this is insane. And it was just like this crazy thing. And um, I remember Andrew had messaged me and he was like, why don't we have this? Like, there are so many cities that have poet laureates and they do all this stuff for the arts. Like, why don't we try to make one? And he was like, you know what? Let me send an email. And I don't know to make it briefly, that email ended up getting um, to city council and they ended up deciding 
let's do it. And so they worked with the libraries and they're like, you know what, we've had one before and it was like eight years ago or something like that. And they're like, you know what, like we need to invest back in the arts. This is something great to have, especially pandemic, like something to look forward to. <laughs> Cause in the heart of 2020, like, you know, there is a lot of artists out there that needed that space. And I remember submitting my videos and all that good stuff so that we could put it in for like the round so that they could do the choosing. And it was just so amazing to see so many artists, especially um, during that time, because it was just, we all know the pandemic was a super difficult time for a lot of people. And you saw people put their heart and soul out there and just give it their all and I just was honestly I was like no matter how this turns out this is so dope to see so many other artists especially my age because it's the youth poet laureate and it's like you get to meet I was seeing people I've worked with before new people and it's just that connection as artists to be like we're still here we're still working we're still loving and like let's make this space and since then I ended up getting chosen which was great and I've been able to like travel and speak I spoke at San Jose State I've spoken at CCUMB Sac State and I've just been able to like kind of get us out there because usually when I go out of Salinas and I'm like, yeah, I'm from Salinas, they're like, where? <laughs> so it's been nice to go to like San Francisco or LA or these other places and be like, I'm from Salinas, Eastside Proud, like this is who we are, we feed the nation, like, you know, so it's been not only I get to share my art and share like my love for it with the world, but it's also like, I get to give a shout out back to Salinas. So that's been a great experience. Is it uh, Amanda Gorman that you were referencing as the um, Youth Poet Laureate for the United States? Yeah. Yeah, her performance at the inauguration was amazing, so. It really was. I was in tears. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Daniel, how about your your uh, thoughts on Poet Laureatehood? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure thing. So um, I applied, you know, I, I uh, was nominated to apply for the, for the position and I had to submit, of course, mm -hmm. like, poetry samples and a, um, a, a statement of plans and a CV and all that good stuff. And then I was I was notified in late December and then of course announced in January. Um, and uh, shout out to, you know, them, you know, Amanda Gorman putting poetry back in like the forefront of, of folks' minds. And I think it's cool that that poetry, I mean, poetry has al always been like a, it should be a tool for like, you know, um, truth telling, right, and excavation. Um, Joseph Stalin, you know, famous terrible dictator, when he came into power, he said, you know, kill off all the writers, kill off all the poets. That was his first thing to do when he came into power. And the reason is because poetry does have the ability to affect change. So in the same way, like when I was appointed the laureate of Monterey County, the first poet laureate of Monterey County, what I think about it as, as in, in a way that I'm a vehicle for, for the stories that are already here, right? Like there's folks in the county that already have stories in their own bellies. There's folks in the county that already has have poetry. There's folks in the county that already has um, have truth to tell, right? And so I guess my role, and I'm thinking about my role as a way to be a vector, to be a vehicle, um, to provide platforms for folks to kind of share their own stories, to share their own, you know, truths, right? To make sense of out of out of their triumphs, make sense out of their uglies, make sense out of their their beauties. Um, and so I yeah I plan to. to to kind of just use my my role as as a you know as a bridge to to you know exposing poetry and letting folks know that poetry is not like one singular thing and there's folks that are living and alive and writing poems right they're not all you know all dead you know um and so folks too can 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 chime in and have their own stories to share and um i think that should be the role of any laureate right is to kind of unbelly the stories of folks that are that are in the the area in which they're the laureate of Right, um, it's a service. It's a service role, right? And I think poetry, Langston Hughes says, poetry is for the people, um, and it should be of the people, right? And so that's why I, how I think about it as well. It's uh, I, it, this kind of a re was referenced already, but um, are you both finding people more um, more receptive to poetry in this uh, this current environment? Uh, geez, receptive. That's a good question. I think more folks know the word poetry and know what a poem might be, right? Just because of, again, it's been put on like a, a platform, a national platform, right? Nationally televised and all that good stuff. So that's cool. I think um, what has to be done now is for folks to like really unpack what, what poetry can be and the possibilities of poetry. And that again, it's not like one singular thing and that it doesn't have to fit into like a box, that there's all kinds of ways to approach poetry 
And, um, and I think that's like the next step, right? So now the foot is in the door for poetry, right? On a, on a national kind of level. Now I think the next step is to kind of develop what that means and how poetry can be used in, in service of justice and truth. I completely agree. Um, there are, when you're a poet, you know a lot of words. And um, I would say the best one is just forward, you know? And I feel like that's been the thing we've seen the most. I'm, I'm just gonna shut off my camera, sorry. Um, I would say that what we've been seeing most is us moving forward and being able to kind of have this stepping stool where people understand what we're doing and they see what we're doing, but they're kind of in between where they're like, oh, we, we've heard of poetry, we heard of Shakespeare and all these other things. And it's usually quite frankly dead poets. And I think because poetry is so fluid that when sometimes you're doing spoken word or poetry or whatever you would love to call it, they're like, well, that's not what I'm, what I was educated on. That isn't what I know. That's what wasn't what I was taught in school. And so I think the best way I can describe poetry is a bridge. And it very much allows us to not only be ourselves, but to build an understanding that wasn't there before. So I think especially having the national coverage now and people understanding like, whoa, this is a great, beautiful thing that people are being more receptive once they understand it. This seems like a good moment for uh, another reading. Um, and this time, uh, Kenya, if you'd like to go first and we'll follow with Daniel. So this piece is one I did recently because I was asked um, for Cluster Park. We were having a Christmas celebration and um, they asked, the city of Salinas asked me to do a poem for Cluster Park. And I grew up on the east side and anyone who's from the east side or even Salinas knows the history of Cluster Park. So um, especially as of late, and it was just a piece to recognize the history of Cluster Park to the Salinas people, but also what we can be and you know, and the healing of Salinas. So this is my piece titled Cluster Park. I have always believed that all places have stories, special places that share tales with those willing to listen, the kind of memories that live in scrapbooks and sidewalks, hidden moments like kisses to those we love and altars to those we've lost. Our city is the greatest storyteller I have ever known. In this city, there are stories everywhere you look, our homes, our cultura, our history, all of this and at its center, Cluster Park. Stories of this park spilled from the tongues of abuelas for generations, the times of paleteros lifting spirits with just one ring, eager kids watching the new pickup game begin and then a new generation waiting for their turn on the court. It's funny how nothing ever changes, haunted by violence and loss, though beautiful, this park has held darkness and light. A warning to return home before the street lights glow diminished. Hope you wouldn't see someone you knew on the five o'clock news. The haven that opened its arms to many, forced barren by gangs and violence. Stories that kept kids from coming too close. Though people might not see it, this park is as much home as the city. This park has experienced the joy when we hit our first home run and grief when another lost their lives on these streets. She has been at every birthday and memorial. This park was a childhood of merry-go-rounds, spinning fast and holding on for dear life, a metaphor of how we would survive. The lights and the sounds of late night cruising, kids up past their bedtime, snuggled on the floorboards of cruisers, learning how to duck low and hold on tight. The way we were taught to play and the way we live, Cluster Park, the heart of the east side, a monument of our strength, our courage, our resilience. It tells a story of opportunity and change. Salinas has its own history, just like the park in these streets. We know the way people see us. We can change and create a new story for ourselves, a town filled with dreamers that feed this world. Stories change. And the city is proof of that and how powerful this community would be if we spoke more about the things that connected us rather than the things that set us apart. A new chapter has begun with thousands of pages and so much left to be read. Cluster Park, a book that is rated so long to be read, eager for us to return and remember. So together, let's open the book and let's begin. Um, I'll do Ode to Elijah, uh, which is about my nephew who's beautiful and amazing, but hasn't always been told that. It's called Ode to Elijah. Uncle. Do you want to fight? Uncle, come on, let's fight. 
a question my nephew has asked me since he could talk. Must be Kane, Triple H, or The Undertaker influencing him to want to brawl sporadically. I never stopped to think that maybe, well, maybe Elijah had more pinned up emotion than a child should. Maybe he mixed up fireball, quarrel, and reprisal. Maybe Elijah is angry at the universe for its ignorance about him. On January 28th, 1999, circa 9.45 p.m., he was born. A seven pound, two ounce miracle, Elijah came out of the womb ass first and society has looked at him backwards ever since. The first time I held him, I could feel the weight of his heart and the density of his mind. Elijah has been diagnosed with autism for as long as I could remember. Elijah, you're one of a kind. God handpicked you to be different, carefully crafted each of your neurons to function like fluttering wings of butterflies, symphonic hymns that float, too brilliantly to be captured, Elijah. Never let them tell you you're sick or crippled or flawed. Your brain is just too complex for them to comprehend. Never let them shackle your thoughts like precious stars in prison there. This world has progressed on the spines of people as beautiful as you. A spectrum of autistic genius, Einstein, Jackson, Mozart, Bob Dylan, Warhol, Elijah, they've mistaken artistic for autistic, misdiagnosed the heaven and your heartbeat when did poetry cease to be an accepted language? When did my nephew's words become too shiftless, too false settled to be understood? Mass education marked by marginalization is manipulation. This is for every person that's ever been called retard, special, slow, crippled, crazy, derpy, dumb, freaks, or feeble-minded for those naturally rebel firework frame torsos that have been classified as diseased, our lust for conformity has left our creativity behind. But nephew, you are new. Your brain has yet to be mapped. You are powerful. You are exuberant. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Never let them Christopher Columbus, a mind that God already lives in. May your voice be as free as your ancestors once were. Speak with the courage we've all abandoned. Live big, live gorgeous, live on purpose. And the next time you ask me to fight, I'll say, yeah, yeah, Elijah. We'll fight this unappreciative world together which is you and me, one day at a time. That was amazing from, from, uh, from both of you. And um, following those readings, I wanted to ask um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, performing, you know, a poetry reading, poetry slam, a spoken word event. Um, are there parts you love about that, parts that are difficult? What's it like to lay your innermost thoughts out for the world to see? I think performing has always been super healing for me, especially when I first started. A lot of my poetry it was about my experience growing up and just growing in abuse and being diagnosed with post post traumatic stress disorder and how it feels like to be to have those out of body experiences where you feel like a crazy person you know and the things that people don't talk about and so a lot of my poetry was very much like i'm going to talk about the things that people don't want to talk about and if it makes you uncomfortable i apologize but i got to let this stuff out and um i remember one of the most dynamic performances i ever had was like the first one and i have a poem called survival skills 101 and um I talked about how my father basically gave me survival skills that like it not just how to survive in the woods, but to survive life. Like, you know, the things that you are never supposed to have to survive as a child. I was like, you gave me the list. And that was like my first poem where I actually no one knew, you know, and I think that's the thing, beautiful thing about poetry is that you can just let the truth out and it's in the room with other artists and lovers and these amazing people. And I remember I did that poem and I was just weeping after it. And I think it just, it has an emotional toll. I think that's the biggest part that I like is, can be a little um, difficult sometimes that I'm a super emotional person. And especially like, I remember when I did Salas the first time, like every time I do a poem, I'll cry. You know, I've gotten better at it as you can tell, but I've always gotten like, it's like your heart is exposed and at any moment, anyone could just do whatever they want, but we trust each other and we love each other. And it's like, okay, we share space. This is your space. And I remember I did that for the uh, Salinas High School District 
And then the next year after I graduated, they invited me back to be a judge. And I had performed all four years, like competing and stuff. So me, I'm like, this is the biggest moment of my life. I was like freaking out. And I was like, well, I'm official. And I remember after um, after the judge and we got to like choose uh, the winners and stuff, this younger girl came up to me and she's like, hi. She's like, and I remember her name's Anna. And she's like, hi, I'm a sophomore. She's like, last year I saw you perform and you, you did Survival Skills 101. And that was the first time in my life where I was like, she knows, she actually knew the name and stuff. And she was like, I have a stutter. She's like, I have a speech impediment. And she's like, but I saw you on stage and you were so loud and big and you were just like so awesome. And she's like, I want to do poetry too. And she was like, so I decided this year I was going to do it. And I found out you were one of the judges. So I knew I had to do it. And she was like, I, when I tell you, I was, <laughs> I was weeping and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, this is probably such a horrible introduction of me crying, but I just, for the rest of my life, I'll remember that moment. I think I was like 19 and I just, every time I perform, I just think of Anna and I'm just like, Okay, that's why we do it. Even when we get emotional and it can be kind of nerve wracking, um, uh, I do it because there's someone in that audience or someone on that stage with you where they're going to remember that for the rest of their lives, just like you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similarly, um, you know, being able to like connect with folks, empathize with folks through performance is always like, you know, an otherworldly experience. And I think, you know, um, I also too, sometimes I'm really emotional after a reading or, or a performance. And for me, it's because I'm like really dejected. And because again, you know, poetry requires you to kind of, you know, discover things about yourself that you didn't when you sat down to write it and to confront things, right? That are often difficult to confront. And so when I'm done reading a poem, performing a poem, it's, it takes a lot out, right? It takes a lot out of you physically, emotionally, spiritually. So. Um, but because poetry is a bodily art form, right, then it, it, it has to be wrapped up in, you know, that same kind of toll. It has to take a toll. Otherwise, you know, is it really a bodily experience, right? And so, um, yeah, I have a very similar experience to, to, to Kenya in that it, it takes a lot out, right? Um, but I think there's, there's no better way than like performance through, you know, performing a poem, right? Again, before there was a printing press, stories were told orally, right? Oral precedes the written, right? So performance poetry, spoken word, slam, all of that predates anything in, in, in book form, right? And I know lately, you know, book form has taken like the pedestal and they, they like the stepsister, stepbrother spoken word, but really it predates anything that was written down, right? Because it's a bodily art form, because, you know, folks told stories orally, right, through the body. And so similarly, you know, I'll never stop performing, reading my work because that's, that's where I began, right? I have roots in slam, I have roots in performance. And that's where I met some of the both, you know, the best and most amazing folks. Um, so yeah, shout out to, to performance and, and, and performance poets. So my final question for you, as we head towards uh, the end and the Q and A from the, from, um, the audience is, um, what would your advice be to someone who's getting started or to someone who wants to support a person getting started as a poet? That's good. I'll, I'll say um, first, to, well, for the person that wants to start writing is to tell the truth. And that's a tough thing to, to, again, to like wrestle with early on, because again, writing poetry requires you to confront things, especially about yourself that you did not know otherwise or that you wouldn't otherwise. And so um, it's often very easy to like, to shy away from telling the truth, right? To, to kind of avoid that. But as long as you can kind of like dive in head first and tell the truth, you'll, your writing will be, you know, that much better and you'll be rewarded. For somebody that wants to, to, to um, support somebody getting started, I say two things. One, buy them lots of books, uh, get, start like a book fund, right? Like, a, I don't know, start a GoFundMe or something for them to, to buy some books. Um, and then two, be patient, right? Like writing is a very slow, um, often like patient process. And so you have to be patient with the person that's um, in that process of writing and, and trying to you know, wrestle with language because um, it requires patience and, and kind of long suffering. So to start, one of my favorite quotes when it comes to poetry is by Alice Walker. And she says, poetry is a lifehood of rebellion, revolution and raising of consciousness. And so that is always, how especially when I, I've worked with kids my whole life and a lot of them like love poetry and they love art and they're like why isn't this happening fast like I want it to why isn't it coming together the way I want to and 
it's always good to hear that all good things take time. And I think we have so much pressure on ourselves as artists and just as people in general, we very much overthink. And I know personally I have to where I'm like, why isn't this coming together the way I want it to? And I just think for those who are interested in writing, do it. There's nothing stopping you. He's like, the only one stopping you is you. And you have no idea you taking that one step to write that sentence or to write that poem or to read that book could change your life forever. Because I, growing up, my dad was a rapper. So you always had like journals around. And I just be like, what are you writing? You know, because I, I don't know how to write yet. I just remember him always having a pencil and stuff. And he was just like, you'll get it. And now I'm like older and I'm like, I get it. And it's just, you know, sometimes you just need a notebook next to you. Sometimes you just need to have something near you where you can have that outlet, where you can have that way out. And I know for me, it was my way out and it is that way for a lot of people. And if you love what you do, and if you have that on your heart where you're like, this is what I wanna do, don't let anyone stop you. And that's the thing, I waited so long. I didn't start sharing my poetry until I was like almost in high school. And I regretted it because I had so much to say and such little time to say it. So we only have one life, do what you, do what you want and do what you love. And I think for those who wanna support, I completely agree with Daniel. Get them books because I'm an avid reader and that changed my whole philosophy, my way of living, my way of loving. And I just think understanding that all good things take time and with your support and with your love, great things happen. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and as a librarian, I would say get them a library card too. Um, all right, so that's the end of the formal questioning. Uh, and uh, Isela, I believe you have a bit to say about the um, Youth Poet Laureate. Yeah, so right before we open the floor up to questions from the audience, I'd like to bring up that we're actually looking for the next Salinas Youth Poet Laureate. So Kenya's term, unfortunately, is coming to an end. And the Salinas Public Library will be accepting submissions from young poets ages 13 through 19 throughout the month of April. So the new poet laureate will be selected by a group of judges. They'll serve a two-year term and they'll receive a prize. We're also selecting a vice laureate. So if you are interested in applying or if you know anyone who might be interested, please share the news. I'll include the link in the chat to our website page, um, which has more information about the position and how to apply. And uh, do you want to take a moment to mention about um, uh, Daniel's books? So... Daniel has two collections. Um, one is Divine Divine. The other one is Mausoleum of Flowers. And that one's actually um, going to be released later on this month. Um, we've ordered three copies, um, one for each of our libraries. So I'll include the link to our catalog. While they are not ready to be checked out, you can put it on hold. So you'll be the first one that it goes towards for anyone interested. And Kenya, let me just mention uh, when you have books, please make sure we know about them. Um, so we can add them. We actually had a comment from Dorothy. She quoted one of your um, poems, Daniel. It was, they have mistaken artistic for autistic. Um, so her daughter is actually on the spectrum and is very artistic. So she'll be sure to read um, your poem to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to you, Dorothy. Also, that poem is on YouTube. So if you want to revisit it, um, feel free to, to, you could just Google or YouTube uh, search Old to Elijah and it should pop up. So you can revisit it. And Kenya, do you have readings available on YouTube or through your social media? Yeah, so I have uh, video recordings uh, on YouTube if you ever want to see any of my stuff live. I also put copies of all my poems and videos on my website. And if you just want to see me trying to live through college and also write poetry, I also have stuff on my Instagram. Go ahead. Also Lisa. add to the chat um, both of the poets' info, including their website and their Instagram. So I've added Kenya's, I'll add Daniel's right now, but I noticed that there is a question from Gus. So he is a new poet. Um, what are some ways he can share his poems with the public? Yo, hit up them open mics, Gus. And luckily for you, open mics nowadays, a lot of them take place virtually. So you don't even have to leave your, you know, your, your house. You can, um, you know, join in from, from Zoom or whatnot. Uh, also support like local open mics and like local, local joints happening because oftentimes, that's where folks, you know, um, are the most supportive and loving and welcoming. And they're all there to do the same thing, you know, share their, their, their soul, their truth. And so I think it's one of the safest places to share your work and to start sharing your work with, with, with the public, like as you, as you asked. 
completely agree. If you are in A31, there are always events going on. I know in Selena's Bearded Bean does like open mics every month or even more so. So there's always nice coffee shops having some. So if you just want like a low key, just I know it can be really like nerve wracking the first time you do it, but it's so great that you're taking this step. And um, if you're not ready for like performance stuff, I know for me, I started a blog and they're for free on like WordPress, which is now my website, weirdly enough. Um, <laughs> and so you can just publish that and just um, find other poets in your area, find other artists, that kind of thing. So if you're ready to perform, there are always great open mics around. And if not, there's always online resources that you can put share your work with everyone. Okay, uh, Daniel and Kenya, do you have any uh, any final thoughts you want to share? Anything you didn't get a chance to say? Um, anything you want to leave our our uh, attendees with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna share uh, um, the introduction to my first collection because I think it's um it's fitting for the conversation. So I'll read this really quick and then I'll I'll end there. If that's okay. My grandfather was a carpenter, which meant he could make magic with his bare hands. I once watched as he split a two by four in half to build the front and rear axles of my go-kart. I was seven in languaging. This lesson was on etymology. I knew English like prison didn't add up when I realized the term sawdust pays more credence to the destroyer than the destruction. I realized saws didn't have dust at all, just blades. And dust was only dust because it was at the bottom. The same way, Tanahasi Coates explains, Black is just someone's name for being at the bottom. I didn't see this as a metaphor for language in 98, but I did when I set out to write these poems many years later. The dust being my language, my language being my body. In this collection, I explore this metaphor through the lens of East and West Oakland in the early 2000s, through the beat of Beast 14th and the trauma of adolescence. I hope to magnify a black boy's proximity with death, God, a tribe called Quest, and Shakespeare. I hope to let the homies in through the back door in these poems, to sing and celebrate the time mitigating our low hanging pants and Air Force One crease preventing walks. I hope there is a prayer in these pages that allows them to talk to God in whatever language they feel comfortable with. There are many ways we share experience and music is among the greatest, Biggie or Pac or Frank or KDOT in particular, the we and we gonna be all right lets us know blackness is not monolithic. Our music sings our glory. These poems showcase black as a congregation, a collective of fist, each with enough holy to grab heaven by the throat. These pages offer the blacktop as a communal space to make sense of fire, entrepreneurship, retribution, and revelation. Poems know what they want to be and how they want to arrive there. In Divine, 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 it is the BART train or a mongoose bicycle with a busted chain and a boy learning how to speak while riding them both. A boy who knows his name and knows what his mother's lips mean when they discharge it each time. A boy who recalculates his worth each time a black body stops breathing. A boy who believes in survival as a tool for vengeance, survival as salvation. What is more divine than a non-dying thing? My people die, but never die. Our bodies may go, but our tongues don't. Language is proof that we're alive, proof that we are divine. It was beautiful. We actually did get a question in the chat while you were reading. Um, it's from Landon. How do you fight that feeling of my old poems weren't good since you are always evolving? Yo, shout out to Landon. What up, man? Thanks for coming through. Landon's the homie. So I, I'll answer this. I'll, I'll start, Kenya, if, if you don't mind. Uh, that's a good question, number one. Number two, I don't have an answer, like a good answer for that um since you're always evolving yeah 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 oh i do have an answer here's the answer um there is no answer and because writing is the process of wrestling with something then the same way that we think about our old poems is the same way we think about wrestling with um new work and evolving so i guess in short that means that we're never after the answer but we're always after the process and writing is the process and so as long as you focus on the process and you don't have to worry about like the result which is the bad poem or the old poem that you're, you're you've evolved from so that's my little two cents my little spill I completely agree I feel like I look back and I'm like 
it's not my, how do I explain this? It's not that I look down at the work, I see how far I've come and there's a difference. It doesn't have a negative connotation. I just think in that moment that like 12 year old Kenya was like, this, this was phenomenal. You know, this was her heart, this was her soul. And as I grew older, I got to know what my heart and soul wanted and what I really wanted to say with better words, you know? And it's just, language is a beautiful thing and so is poetry. So no matter what you create, you're still a creative. No matter what you sing, you're still a singer. And I just think over time, it's not negative. It's more like you get to see where you came from. And that's the most beautiful thing because those are the roots to the rest of the, everything else we will blossom. That's great. Um, it's it's really, uh, I'm so glad that both of you were able to be here with us today. Um, this has been one of our more enjoyable First Friday Art Talks. And uh, we're gonna wrap up now. Um, Daniel and Kenya, thank you so much. And uh, and I guess we're, we're done for today. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>